When it comes to horror stories, it doesn't get any worse than this. It's about as deplorable as human behavior gets. I found myself rereading the attack, almost as if I didn't want to believe what I was reading was true. Jennifer Dougherty was a 30-year-old woman from Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. She was born with a mental disability, leaving her with the mental capacity of a child, and like most children, she was naive. Jennifer was a kind and pleasant person, friendly and trustworthy. She believed in the goodness inherent in everyone. Rather than get upset when others were antagonistic or mean towards her, she would consider that they might be having a bad day, and she would make extra effort to be kind to them. She enjoyed caring for her sister's children and working on vehicles with her uncle. One day, she hoped that she would be employed as a mechanic, just like him. It is said that the foods that she liked most were lasagna and cheesecake, and that she was a big fan of scary movies and college football and wrestling. As a child, she was frequently bullied and told her mother that sometimes she wished she could just be a normal girl. Jennifer aspired to the kind of life that non-disabled girls often take for granted, but which are often denied to disabled women. To be independent, a member of a community, to have a job, to get married, and to have children. She lived in Mount Pleasant, but she frequently travelled to Greensburg by herself for dentist and counselling appointments. Her parents pressured her to move out and to be more independent, despite her disability, which they later said they regretted. At the age of 30, she was well on her way to achieving independence. She was attending a trade school for mechanics and making preparations to move into her own apartment. Jennifer was excited that she'd be moving into her own apartment. Her last posting to her MySpace and Twitter accounts read, This is my time to make a new start for myself, make new friends, and not to be afraid of anything. Unfortunately, Jennifer did not live long enough to fulfill her dreams of being independent. In Greensburg, she'd made friends with a 17-year-old girl, Angela Marinucci. Jennifer and Angela would talk on a telephone for hours as if they were teenagers, despite Jennifer actually being a much older individual. Like Jennifer, Angela suffered from a disability. When Angela was 15 years old, she suffered a traumatic head injury that changed her life forever. The two women, Jennifer and Angela, appeared to be the best of friends. Therefore, when Angela invited Jennifer over for a sleepover, Jennifer eagerly accepted. Murphy, Jennifer's stepfather, dropped her off at the bus station. She left behind a note for her mother. Quote, I hope that you will have a good day at work. And I also love you very much. I will talk to you sometime later. Unquote. It was the last time any of her family members saw her alive. Jennifer had known Angela for several years, and they'd been discussing Jennifer's night out at her place. When Jennifer arrived at the sleepover on February the 10th, the mood of the evening quickly changed and tragically altered the course of her life. There were six people in the apartment. Angela Marinucci, Peggy Miller, Amber Meidinger, Ricky Smearns, Melvin Knight, and Robert Masters. This group would infamously become known as the Greensburg Six. Jennifer had met most of them before and considered them her friends. Over the ensuing 36 hours, Jennifer would be subjected to some of the most egregious and deranged acts of human torture. Soon after Jennifer arrived, the others began to bully her. The bullying escalated from simple heckling to aggravated assault to outright torture. As the group searched through her purse, they stole cash, gift cards and her cell phone. As if that wasn't enough, they also poured liquids into her bag, bashed her head with filled soda bottles, cut her hair, painted her face with nail polish and poured liquids and spices on her head and in her eyes. Jennifer was repeatedly beaten with a metal towel rack and crutches. The torture stopped, but only temporarily. After being stripped naked, Jennifer was hidden in an attic while Ricky's old roommate visited before being moved by Melvin to a bedroom. In a testimony, Amber said, quote, I opened the door and saw Jennifer on the floor. Melvin was on top of her. She had a sock in her mouth and he was holding her down, raping her. Ricky, the alleged ringleader, then called the first of four family meetings that evening to decide how to deal with Jennifer before the group went to sleep. Jennifer's life was in grave danger and the next morning she tried to escape. She was stopped and punished. Jennifer was forced to drink three different concoctions that contains urine, feces, 
bleach, vegetable oil, deodorant, cigarette ash, and crushed pills. Jennifer constantly asked why she was being tortured and begged them to set her free, to which the Greensburg Six mercilessly denied. Ricky organised another meeting and decided that keeping Jennifer alive was a risk to their freedom since she would likely report the Greensburg Six to the authorities. A unanimous decision was made concerning Jennifer's fate. They forced Jennifer to write a fake suicide note. In Amber's testimony, she said Ricky and Melvin tied Jennifer up with Christmas lights. Quote, They were plugged in and Angela was mad because the lights didn't blink. Jennifer was tied up to look like a Christmas tree. Unquote. Ricky and Melvin then went to the kitchen to grab a steak knife. Melvin sadistically asked Jennifer if she was ready to die before repeatedly stabbing her in the heart and lungs and slashing her throat. Despite the brutal stab wounds, Jennifer was still very much alive. The bitch still ain't dead, shouted Melvin. He then handed the knife to Ricky, who slit Jennifer's wrists. Jennifer, who was still holding on to life at this point, was choked by the men by pulling out the ends of the Christmas lights that were looped around her neck. Jennifer finally succumbed to her injury sustained during the brutal attack over the last two days. They wrapped Jennifer's body in a plastic bag and dumped her body in a trash can in the parking lot of Greensburg Salem Middle School. On February 11th, a truck driver noticed a trash can in the parking lot while driving. When he looked closer, he discovered Jennifer's body inside. Jennifer was discovered in a deplorable state, with her head shaved and fingernail polish smeared all over her face. The pyjamas were so saturated with blood that the original colours of her clothes was not visible. He immediately called 911. Jennifer's mother, Denise Murphy, was brought in to identify the body. Something no mother should ever have to do. Quote, I was in total shock and still in total denial. I just couldn't imagine how that could happen to her. Unquote. Angela and the others were quickly arrested. Amber, Peggy and Robert all pleaded guilty to the murder and gave detailed gruesome testimonies about the murder. They described how Angela became jealous of Jennifer and feared that she was developing a relationship with Ricky, who was her boyfriend. They alleged that it was Angela who had lured Jennifer to the apartment, and once here, Ricky led the attack on Jennifer. Police had not accused Peggy and Robert of participating in the physical abuse and murder of Jennifer. But evidence during the trials indicated that they were part of the family meetings in which the group agreed that Jennifer should be murdered. At one point during the ordeal, Peggy and Robert had been left alone with Jennifer while the other four left the apartment. During this time, Jennifer begged them to let her go or to call for help. Instead, however, Peggy and Robert alerted the rest of the group. Their lawyers attempted to argue that they were scared of the others and feared that they too would be murdered. Both Peggy and Robert would make tearful pleas for leniency. Quote, I was scared for my life. I should have done something, but I didn't because I was scared. Can the family forgive me? Unquote. Peggy said, quote, I am sorry and I am guilty. She was my friend and I should not have voted for her to die. Unquote. Jennifer's family responded to their statements and asked the judge for them to receive harsh sentences for their role in the murder. Quote, you had my sister as a friend. She loved Peggy and valued her. You didn't value her. You probably value a hairbrush more than you value her. Unquote. Peggy Darlene Miller was sentenced to 35 to 74 years in prison. Robert Masters pleaded guilty to third degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit kidnapping on December 19, 2013. He was sentenced to 30 to 70 years. Amber Meidinger was sentenced to 40 to 80 years in prison after pleading guilty to third degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. She almost received the death penalty until she agreed to testify with the others. Angela Marinucci was found guilty of first-degree murder and was formally given a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. Angela was 17 at the time of the crime and therefore ineligible for the death penalty. Melvin Knight pled guilty to first- and second-degree murder, kidnapping and conspiracy to murder and kidnap. On August 30th, 2012, a jury decided to execute Melvin. Melvin filed an appeal against his sentence in September 2014, and his trial was postponed several times before his sentence was upheld in March 2019. In 2020, he filed another appeal, which was unanimously denied by the judges. Ricky Smyrns, the ringleader, was sentenced to death. 
Defense attorney Terence Fate promised to appeal Ricky's sentence, saying that the jury didn't give enough consideration to Ricky's abusive upbringing and that the prosecution was wrong to argue that torture was an aggravated circumstance to qualify Ricky for the death penalty because he, personally, didn't kill Jennifer. Quote, I think they got it wrong. I fail to see that a person who has had this horrific background that this child has had is not entitled to some mercy. Unquote. Terence argued that Ricky suffered from multiple personalities and other mental problems stemming from his background of physical and sexual abuse as a child of a drug-addicted prostitute and a gang member. In arriving at the sentence, the jury also weighed Ricky's extensive criminal record, including the rape of a school classmate when he was 11, and considered, but rejected, evidence that he was legally, mentally retarded, as defined in a 2002 US Supreme Court decision. The decision prevents executing such people as cruel and unusual punishment. Prosecutor John Peck told jurors that Ricky deserved the death penalty because it is reserved for, quote, the worst of the worst murders and against the worst of the worst defendants, unquote. Ricky was the only one of the six defendants who knew Jennifer when he invited her to visit him. Ricky was dating a 17-year-old Angela Marinucci at the time and, the prosecution says, used Jennifer to make the teen jealous, which fueled the eventual torture. In February 2017, a judge upheld his death sentence, and his execution was delayed in 2017. He is currently on death row in a Pennsylvania prison. Jennifer's family still struggle with the decision to let her go to Greensburg alone. Jennifer Doggerty's sister, Joy Burkholder, said after the sentencing, quote, My biggest regret was forcing Jennifer to act as an adult. I would go back and do many things differently. Unquote. Bobby, Jennifer's stepfather, said, quote, Closure is Jennifer coming back to us, and Jennifer won't come back so there is no closure." Unquote. Abuse and exploitation are constant dangers for people with developmental disabilities. In fact, they are four to ten times more likely to be abused than people without disabilities. Society view disabled people as weak and vulnerable, making them easy targets for predators. People with disabilities have the right to freedom, respect, equality and dignity. They have the right to live life to their full potential to have control over their own life and to live free from abuse or neglect. If you or someone you know is experiencing violence, abuse or neglect at the hands of an individual or an organization, it is important to seek help.